The next voice you hear is that of the accused assassin of President John F. Kennedy, 24-year-old Lee Harvey Oswald. Here we go. Let's get one shot out. I like some legal representation, but these police officers have not allowed me to, to have any. I uh, I don't know what this is all about. I killed the president. Black guy. No, so I didn't. People How'd keep asking me that. Sir? Did you shoot the president? I work in that building. Were you in the building at the time? Naturally, if I work in that building, yes, sir. Back up, man. Did you Come shoot on, the man. president? No, they're Thank taking you. me in because of the fact that I live in the Soviet Union. I'm just a patsy. Chief, do you have any concern for the safety of your prisoner in view of the high feeling among the people of Dallas over the assassination of the president? No, but precautions necessary, precautions will be taken, of course. Now the prisoner uh, wearing a black sweater, he has changed from his T-shirt, is being uh, moved out toward an armored car. There is the prisoner. Do you have anything to say in your defense? Oswald has been shot. Oswald has been shot. I think my son was a patsy, and I think history will prove this. I won't be here to read about it, but all of the children listening to my voice today, I would like you to remember my words. Quote, I think history will absolve Lee Harvey Oswald of any involvement in the deaths attributed to him. I'm sorry, I can't go through with this because I can't get it off my mind, Allison. It's obsessing me. Oh, I'm getting tired of it. I need your attention. It, but it, it, it doesn't make any sense. He drove past the book depository and the police said conclusively that it was an exit wound. So how is it possible for Oswald to have fired from two angles at once? It doesn't make sense. Alvy, then everybody's in on the conspiracy. The FBI and the CIA and J. Edgar Hoover and oil companies and the Pentagon and the men's room attendant at the White House. No, I, I would leave out the men's room attendant. You're using this conspiracy theory as an excuse to avoid sex with me. Almost from the beginning, the discussion of the assassination has been dominated by, as I would put it, two churches. If you belong to the Church of the Lone Assassin, then you are certain that both Oswald and Ruby were lone nuts who did what they did for entirely personal reasons. That means for you that any piece of evidence tending to show a conspiracy must be false. So members of that church, whose high priests really at this point are Gerald Posner and Vincent Bugliosi, among others, can always find some reason to discount evidence and move on. Now, on the other side, we have the Church of the Grand Conspiracy, whose founder, I suppose, was Mark Lane, and whose high priest, really, is Oliver Stone. And if you belong to the Church of the Grand Conspiracy, any discrepancy in the evidence, and in such a huge, complex case, there are bound to be dozens of discrepancies, is proof of both a conspiracy and a cover-up. Then, in the middle, as I would put it, there are a few people uh, including Bob Blakey, who was the counsel to the House Assassinations Committee, and myself, who feel that Oswald did it, and that he fired certainly all the shots that hit, but that he did it as part of a conspiracy put together by organized crime, and specifically by Sano Traficanti, Carlos Marcello, and John Martino, the man who really uh, did the field work on the ground. The Warren Commission report conclusively established that this man, Lee Harvey Oswald, killed President John Fitzgerald Kennedy. Was he a hired killer, a communist agent, or was he just a lunatic? Lee Harvey Oswald is one of history's great enigmas. There are so many things about him that don't add up. I mean, here's a guy who enlists in the Marines when he's young after studying the communist manuals before he enlists. Uh, he ends up in Japan at the Atsugi Naval Air Base and monitoring U-2 spycraft, supposedly defects to Russia with secrets about the U-2. But then there are questions about uh, what was that really all about? Was, was Oswald dispatched on some kind of mission by the CIA or military intelligence to 
turn over certain secrets to the Russians and then maybe see where that went. Then he marries a Russian woman. He comes back to the United States in the summer of 62, is befriended by a man named George de Morenshield, who's another very mysterious and shady character who uh, is connected to the oil industry and to the CIA and uh, most likely debriefed Oswald for the CIA. Oswald goes to work after he's been a defector to Russia for a company called Jagger's Child Stovall, which is involved with in some kind of mapping during the Cuban Missile Crisis. I mean, what's going on with this guy? In the fall of 63, in September, late September, Oswald shows up in Mexico City, goes to the uh, Cuban and Soviet consulates trying to get a visa to get into Cuba. But the photographs that the CIA eventually has of this person who's shown up at those embassies is not of Oswald, but maybe somebody impersonating him. So it gets weirder still. Oswald is definitely being watched at that time very closely by the CIA's counterintelligence people, uh, James Angleton, and also by the uh, special affairs staff headed by Desmond Fitzgerald. They've got all these marked card files on Oswald that indicate they're watching him for a reason because he's in touch with mysterious people or they're following him for, for some strange reason that we still don't know the answer to. So, very mysterious fellow. Lee Harvey Oswald had been born in New Orleans in 1939. He never knew his father, who died before he was born. He was a somewhat troubled youth. Uh, Norman Mailer discovered he was dyslexic, which probably caused him a lot of trouble in school, even though he was really quite intelligent. His mother, I think, was pretty emotionally unstable. The family, as it turns out, was quite mob-connected. He had an uncle, uh, Charles Dutz Moret, who was a member of the Marcello organization and a bookie in Los Angeles, and his mother had a couple of boyfriends with mob connections. Mr. Oswald, uh, I'm curious about your personal background. Uh, if you could tell us something about uh, where you came from, mm -hmm. your education, and uh, your, your career to date, we'd be interested. I'd be very happy to. I was born in New Orleans in 1939. Uh, for a short length of time during my childhood, I lived in Texas and in New York. I remember some of the conversation I had with Oswald right from the beginning, and Lee was remembering his young days in New Orleans. When he was 12 or 13, he realized the some injustices of our segregationist ways and began looking for other answers. Where, I asked curiously, in Marx, the capital, he said, rather solemnly. I read it carefully from the first to the last page, said Lee. Maybe I was too young to have understood it completely, but I liked what I did understand. The exploitation of the poor by the rich, for one thing. You can see it all over this country. The strong will always win. He had some interest in left-wing political views from quite an early age, we know, which was pretty unusual at that time. And he was an ornery kind of guy, a very withdrawn kind of guy, very good at hiding his thoughts and feelings. One of the things that always bothers me the most about him is he, he has no vices. He doesn't smoke, he doesn't drink, he doesn't seem to care much about sex, and he doesn't care about money. Now, like many troubled young men in those days, he wanted to get away from home, and as soon as he turned 17, he managed to get into the Marine Corps. I spent three years in the United States Marine Corps, starting out as a private, working my way up through the ranks uh, to the uh, position of Buck Sergeant. My service in the Marine Corps was of great influence on me, said Lee. I served because this was the only way for me to see the world. It's in Japan that the Marxist ideas of equality for all became clear to me. I was in contact with revolutionary young people there, and I liked what they told me. In the Marine Corps, he was in a special unit, a radar unit, tracking the flights of the U-2s. We were worried about the Soviet missile program, and all the defectors we tried to send in were killed. And so the U-2 came into being, and the CI had three stations, and Oswald worked in the one in Japan. Since the beginning of man, tribes and clans and nations have spied on one another across the valleys, across the oceans, and now across the world. We watch for the electronic imprint of the enemy's bombers. We listen for the whine of his missiles. We send beautiful, sophisticated machines over his territory to monitor his coded talk, to make inventory of his weapons. The very air is full of information for the spies of today.
we had a mole, uh, maybe more than one, in, in the KGB. And the, this mole informed us that we had a mole in our U-2 program. So Oswald's trip to the Soviet Union immediately upon leaving the Marines could have been expected to draw the interest of the KGB to attempt to recruit him or to ask him questions that might have helped us discover the identity of the mole in the U-2 program. Richard Nagel is another one of the very curious people who show up in this scenario, indicating for sure there was a conspiracy to assassinate President Kennedy. During the Korean War, he had been the youngest soldier to receive a battlefield commission to captain. He was wounded uh, several times, received the Purple Heart, uh, went on into military intelligence after that, and worked for a top secret military intelligence unit called FOI, Field Operations Intelligence, in Korea and Japan. And it was in Japan in 1957-58, when Nagel was stationed in Japan, and when Oswald was in Japan working uh, as a radar operator at the Atsugi Naval Air Base, that their paths crossed for the first time. In Tokyo, Nagel says Oswald was photographed by the Japanese police uh, approaching the Soviet embassy. And Nagel at the same time had apparently involved Oswald in a plot, it was a CIA plot, to get a Soviet colonel who working for the Russian GRU intelligence named Nikolai Oroshkin to defect. So Oswald was trying to cozy up to Eroshkin in some way, and um, Nagel was involved with Oswald and a professor uh, in Japan named Chikao Fujisawa in this early, you know, intelligence effort in, in Japan. I don't know the whole story of this. There were a lot of things Nagel would never tell me. But it was pretty clear that Nagel had what he called a casual but purposeful acquaintanceship with Oswald in Japan. So my assumption is it was related to his, Oswald's subsequent defection to the Soviet Union with radar secrets. September 11th, 1959. Today, I begin my new life. My mother is temporarily unable to work, so I apply for a hardship discharge to care for her. I leave the base and return to Fort Worth, Texas with my new passport. I've been practicing Russian and will leave soon for the Soviet Union. He got, I believe, a hardship discharge uh, based on the need to support his mother. And then out of nowhere, and again, without telling anybody, he, he takes a boat to Europe. He goes to Finland. He gets into the Soviet Union in Moscow. And he suddenly announces very loudly and publicly that he's going to defect and that he's going to give away radar secrets uh, to the Soviets. I served honorably, having been discharged. Then I went back to work in uh, Texas and have recently arrived in New Orleans. October 28th, I see Soviet officials about citizenship and give them my discharge papers from the Marine Corps. They say, wait for our answer. I ask how long, not soon. October 31st, I have been in the hotel for three days. It seems like three years. I must have some sort of showdown. I make my decision. I've come to give up my American passport and renounce my citizenship. I was recently discharged from the Marine Corps and have planned to do this for two years. I have applied to the Supreme Soviet for citizenship and my allegiance is now to the USSR. Why do you want to defect to the Soviet Union? Because I'm a Marxist. The service opened up my eyes to American imperialism around the world. I don't want a miserable life like my mother. She's just another worker exploited by the capitalist machine. Marx is out of fashion in Moscow. Life is pretty lonely here as a Marxist. I was warned you would try and talk me out of defecting. Are you willing to serve the Soviet state? Absolutely. I told the Soviet authorities that I was a radar operator in the Marines. And if they make me a citizen, I will share classified information of special interest. I leave the embassy elated at this showdown. Returning to my hotel, I feel now my energies are not spent in vain. I'm sure the Russians will accept me after this sign of my faith in them. The most notable thing about Oswald's defection is that he threatened to give up his radar secrets to the Soviet Union. From the moment he made the threat, everybody was interested in him. 
In fact, if you look at the first reports coming into the FBI and sort of turn them over, the ones that are in the National Archives, you'll see the initials of the entire upper crust of the FBI looking at that. Uh, and over the course of the months that followed that threat that he made, there may have been as many as 30 divisions or branches or offices of, of five or six different U.S. intelligence organizations keeping files on him. The threat to commit an act of espionage might have triggered even his arrest. Uh, Richard Snyder told me that since he hadn't actually committed the act, that he couldn't bring in the Marine Guard and arrest him. Um, but his threat to, to do that in front of our people our own people is very unusual. He didn't need to do that to renounce his citizenship. Dear Robert, well, what should we talk about? The weather, perhaps? Surely you do not wish for me to speak about my decision to remain in the Soviet Union and ask for citizenship here, as I am afraid you would not be able to comprehend my reasons. I received your telegram and was glad to hear from you. Only one word bothered me the word mistake. It is not for you to tell me this. You cannot understand my reasons for such a serious action. I will never return to the United States, which is a country I hate. I will never speak to anyone from the United States over the telephone, since it may be taped by the Americans. Should you wish to correspond with me, you can write to the below address. But I really don't see what we could talk about. This is the headquarters of the Central Intelligence Agency of the United States government. It is a depot for subversion and a kind of clandestine university. For many years, its scholarly headmaster was a super spy in the classic mold named Alan Dulles. For the days of Socrates, by various methods, and even before that, uh, mankind has been seeking knowledge of everything that influences his own life or the life of the nation to which he belongs. Do the Russians have a CIA? The KGB is one of the most sinister organizations that ever was organized. Do we have a, an application of morality in our activities they don't? Well, far more than they do, yes. Could you talk on that subject? Well, only that, uh, as far as I know, we don't engage in assassinations and kidnappings and things of that kind. As far as I know, we never have. As far as we know, they have and done it quite consistently. I spent uh, 21 years in Army intelligence, um, much of it uh, working in the National Security Agency. And when the Stone film caused this massive release of intelligence files, I felt like I could do something with that. I understood them, and, and that's what really pulled me into writing the book Oswald and the CIA. The question of the delay in the opening of the 201 file in Oswald is a major problem for the Central Intelligence Agency. This is a file that should be open for intelligence or counterintelligence purposes on anyone of interest to the CIA. And certainly somebody who lights up the Christmas tree uh, by making a, a threat to commit an act of espionage should have triggered that opening from the very beginning. So not to do so it makes him stand out. And the combination of no tool one file and at the same time being on the mail intercept watch list is probably unique. His files were not shared with the Soviet Russia division. They should have been. For six months, they didn't know about him. And when they did, they were very interested in him. Dear Robert, I shall begin by answering your question why I and my fellow workers and communists would like to see the present capitalist government of the U.S. overthrown. Do you remember that time your milk company tried to form a union? Workers must form unions against their employers in the U.S. because the government supports an economic system that exploits all its workers. A system based on credit, which gives rise to a never-ending cycle of depression, inflation, unlimited speculation, and war. In this system, art, culture, and the spirit of man are all subjugated to commercial enterprise. Religion and education are used as tools to suppress a population who would otherwise question a government's unfair economic system and plans for war. I remember well my days in the Marines when I stood offshore in Indonesia waiting to suppress yet another population during their revolution there last year. I can still see Japan and the Philippines and their puppet governments and the American Marines all dressed in uniform 
there because they were drafted or adventurous or unemployed in civilian life. I will ask you a question, Robert. Why do you support the American government? What is the ideal that you stand for? Do not say freedom, because freedom is a word used by all people through all of time. Ask me, and I will tell you that I fight for communism. This is a word that brings to your mind slaves and injustice. This is because of American propaganda. Happiness is not found in oneself. Happiness is taking part in the struggle. The people here have a seven-hour work day and only work till three on Saturdays with Sundays off. Socialism means they do not pay for medical care or their apartments. There is no unemployment here and all work is done for the common good of all. The Russians are a good, warm, alive people who wish to live in peace and see the economically enslaved people of the West free. America is a dying country. I do not wish to be a part of it or to be used as a tool in its military aggressions. I want to live a normal, happy, and peaceful life here in the Soviet Union for the rest of my life. My mother and you are not objects of affection, but only examples of workers in the US. In the event of war, I would kill any American who puts on a uniform in defense of the American government. You should not try to remember me in any way I used to be, for I am only now showing you how I am. I am not all bitterness and hate. I came here only to find peace, and I feel as if I am finally at last with my own people. It's snowing here in Moscow, which makes everything look very nice from my hotel window. I can see the Kremlin and Red Square, and I just finished a dinner of meat and potatoes. So you see, Robert, the Russians aren't all that different from you and I. We just have different ideals. January 4th, I am finally given a Soviet residence document for one year. Not the citizenship I wanted, but still, I am happy. I leave Moscow for Minsk with a lot of money and hope. I write my mother and brother letters in which I say, I do not wish to ever contact you again. I am beginning a new life and don't want any part of the old. They were not interested in him, as it turns out. At least that's the story, and it appears to be true. And they sent him off to a radio factory in Minsk and tucked him away there where he couldn't make trouble. And there he stayed uh, until the spring of 1962. This is Senator John Kennedy, the Democratic nominee for the presidency of the United States. we must seek, if we wish to maintain the balance of power on the side of freedom, the younger men and women who should be most attractive to us as a dynamic free society are beginning to look in another direction, to Castro in Latin America. That is the opportunity before us in the 60s, to be the great defender of freedom in a time when freedom is under attack and under test all over the globe. Thomas Paine said in the American Revolution, the cause of America is the cause of all mankind. And now in the revolution of 1960, the cause of all mankind is the cause of America. Queridos amigos, les habla la esposa del senador John F. Kennedy candidato a la presidencia de los Estados Unidos. En estos tiempos de tanto peligro, cuando la paz mundial se ve amenazada por el comunismo, es necesario tener en la Casa Blanca un líder capaz de guiar nuestros destinos con una mano firme para el futuro de nuestros niños y para logra lograr un mundo donde exista la paz verdadera. Voten ustedes por el Partido Demócrata el día 8 de noviembre. Que viva Kennedy. I look at Cuba, 90 miles off the coast of the United States. In 1957, I was in Havana. I talked to the American ambassador there. He said that he was the second most powerful man in Cuba. 
And yet, even though Ambassador Smith and Ambassador Gardner, both Republican ambassadors, both warned of Castro, the Marxist influences around Castro, the communist influences around Castro, both of them have testified in the last six weeks that in spite of their warnings to the American government, nothing was done. Havana, January 1st, 1959. The 26 de Julio, the 26th of July movement, led by Fidel Castro, had turned out the tyrant Batista. To the Cuban people and to the admiring world, there could be no better way to start the new year. What particular event in your life um, made you decide that the, the Fair Play for Cuba Committee had the correct answer about Cuban-U.S. relations? Well, of course, Americans in general have only begun to notice Cuba since the Cuban Revolution. That's very true, I think. Uh, I became acquainted with it at about the same time as everybody else in 1960. We cut off aid to Batista just before the revolution, just before it. We were just rats leaving a sinking ship, you see. I always felt that the Cubans were being pushed into this, uh, to the Soviet bloc by American policy. Castro's Cuba, even after the revolution, was still a one-crop economy, basing its economy on sugar. When we slashed the uh, Cuban uh, sugar quota, of course, we cut their throat. They had to turn to some other country and had the government of the United States particularly uh, certain covert, uh, uh, covert undercover agencies like the uh, now defunct CIA. And now defunct? Well, its yeah. leadership is now defunct. Alan Dulles is now defunct. I believe that uh, without all that meddling with a little bit different uh, humanitarian handling of the situation, uh, Cuba would not be the problem it is today. Do you know we don't have a single program sponsored by our government to Cuba to tell them our story? to tell them that we are their friends, that we want them to be free again? Which system, communism or freedom, will triumph in the next five or 10 years? That's what should concern us. By 1965 or 1970, will there be other Cubans in Latin America? Who will dominate Asia in the next five or 10 years? Communism, the Chinese, or will freedom? I have seen Cuba go to the communists. I have seen communist influence and Castro influence rise in Latin America. I look up and see the Soviet flag on the moon. Mr. Nixon talks about our being the strongest country in the world. I think we are today, but we were far stronger relative to the communists five years ago. They made a breakthrough in missiles, and by 1961, two and three, they will be outnumbering us in missiles. I'm not as confident as he is that we will be the strongest military power by 1963. Daytime and pickets are synonymous outside the White House, and if nothing else, they confirmed that the world of 1961 was not one of peace, happiness, and freedom. But no line of pickets could tell the story to the president, for the world was far more complex than their signs. The pickets numbered 40 or 50, but upon the floating globe called the world, there were three billion people, and most of them were not happy, or free, or at peace. April 1961. In Cuba's Bay of Pigs, Castro's army repels an invasion by 1,400 men. The attackers are Cuban exiles, equipped by the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency. They hope to free their country. They hope to inspire their countrymen to rise up against the dictator. But Castro knew in advance that they were coming. He had arrested 100,000 Cubans who might have taken action against his regime. There is no rebellion. The Bay of Pigs becomes a disaster for the Cuban exiles and for the United States. I know that many of you have further questions about Cuba. I made a statement on that subject yesterday afternoon. I do not think that any useful national purpose would be served by my going further into the Cuban question this morning. In view of the fact we're taking a propaganda lambasting around the world, why is it not useful, sir, for us to explore with you the real facts behind this or our motivations? Well, I think in answer to your question that uh, we have to make a uh, judgment as to uh, how much we can usefully uh, say that would aid uh, 
interest of the United States. One of the problems of a free society, problem not uh, met by a uh, dictatorship, is uh, this problem of uh, information. A good deal has been printed in the paper. I wouldn't be surprised if those of you who are members of the press will be, see will be receiving a lot of background briefings in the next uh, day or two by uh, interested uh, people or interested agencies. There's an old saying that uh, victory has a hundred fathers and defeat is an orphan. And uh, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, information is poured into you in regard to uh, all the recent activities. I have been fighting Castro since 1959. I never saw my father. I was uh, the only son at home. I came to the United States and Carter never allowed my parents to come out of Cuba. Even I have, according with report, more than 300 other operations inside Cuba. The defeat of Bayo Pig, even they were not involved because Kennedy took over in January and the invasion was in April. Kennedy was really stuck with some plan that some aspect of them did not really prove to be too effective. But you cannot attack it because it was selected, the plane by the, uh, by the militaries. Those boys that went inside Cuba reading the Bible and the rosary in their hand impressed me how they risked their young life fighting for an ideal. And I believe that that is the spirit of the United States of America, too. I remember that he especially expressed his respect for Che Guevara and for Fidel Castro, without hiding his sympathies with the revolutionary movement all over the world. Judge, did he speak about the invasion at all? Yes, he talked about it. He, he mentioned that it was a disaster, that we should not have helped the Cuban refugees. But he was not violent about it never expressed any particular hatred for Kennedy because of that. He said he was wrong, and he said that the Cuban refugees paid for it with their lives, and which they did. I work in a radio factory. As my Russian improves, I become increasingly conscious of just what sort of society I live in. Mass gymnastics, compulsory after-work meetings, and sending the entire shop collective, except me, to pick potatoes on a Sunday at a state collective farm a patriotic duty to bring in the harvest. The unspoken opinion of the workers is that it's a great pain in the neck. January 4th, 1961. One year after I received my residency document, I am asked if I want Russian citizenship. I say no, simply extending my residential passport for another year. I'm starting to reconsider my desire about staying. The work is drab and I can't spend the money I get anywhere. No nightclubs or bowling alleys, no places of recreation except trade union dances. I have had enough. It appears that uh, he was communicating in mail with the embassy about his intent to come back to the United States. And it's about that time, almost exactly at that time, uh, that the 201 file was opened back in uh, CIA headquarters. The whole time, his files were maintained uh, in the counterintelligence area of the CIA. In fact, the mole hunting unit. Why they would wait 15 months before opening a 201 file makes no sense unless he was involved in something and they simply didn't want people inside the CIA to know what was going on, to know of their interest in Oswald. So the story that they had no interest in him, they were contacted and didn't know anything about him, doesn't add up from A to Z. Oswald defected. He lived in Minsk, he married Marina, and then after being in the Soviet Union for a year or two, he announced that he wanted to come home. I've learned a hard lesson the hard way, Mr. Snyder. I've been completely relieved of my illusions about the Soviet Union, and have a new appreciation for the United States and the meaning of freedom. Mr. Oswald, in our first interview in 1959, you said you offered the Soviets information you acquired as a radar operator in the Marine Corps. They never questioned me about my life before entering the Soviet Union, and I never gave them any such information, and would not have had they asked. Oswald's decision to come back home 
uh, may have not been his decision at all. If he's actually there on the mission, uh, he would have been told it's time to come back home. The story uh, that he tells in the embassy or to the embassy is that he changed his mind. He really didn't like the Soviet Union as much as he thought he would, and he really missed the United States and really wanted to come home. Even though he had no money, he asked them to pay for it, and oh, by the way, I now have a wife and a child, would you pay for them too? But it was a very um, simple story, just like that. You know, I, I changed my mind, and I'd like to come home. So it's not very convincing. We have no hard information that his defection was part of any intelligence operation. We do know that there were several parallel cases at that time of Americans, and at least one other had a military background similar to Oswald, who had found themselves in Moscow, who had suddenly defected, and who returned several years later. What's also interesting is that in a couple of those cases, we have their CIA debrief, but we don't have any CIA debrief from Oswald. Although there's some indication that he was informally debriefed by, by the CIA through George DeMornshield in Texas. As to the question of whether Oswald was sent by the CIA um, on a mission, whether it's um, to ferret out a mole or not, uh, it cannot be proven, um, but it can be reasonably um, deduced from the facts of, of his story, and that would be his association with the U-2 program, his ability to get in um, through a sort of a backdoor route very quickly, something that takes most people many, many months to, to uh, achieve, and then this story of threatening to give up radar secrets right in front of our U.S. Embassy officials. Those facts and, and others would suggest that he might have been sent on a uh, false defector mission. The fable of mermaids who live at Wikiwachi. Two of the stars in this world's greatest underwater spectacle swim out to perform graceful acrobatic routines in the crystal clear water. June 4th, 1962. With a loan from the State Department, we cross Europe by train and depart from Rotterdam for New Jersey. When Oswald returns, his handling by the government is, to me, a little odd. The oddest thing is that no one, as far as I can tell, not the FBI, not the CIA, attempts seriously to investigate his claim when he got to Moscow that he was going to give away radar secrets. He's never specifically asked about that. He is interviewed a couple of times in Dallas by FBI agents, and he's somewhat hostile. He refuses to discuss the reasons that he went to Moscow. Uh, and then John Fain, who was the lead agent and who was close to retirement, uh, dropped it. Now, Agent Hosty, who becomes a big player in the case, remains interested, but he's much more concerned about Marina because he thinks the Soviets have a program of marrying KGB agents to foreigners as a means of infiltrating them into the West. Mrs. Payne, it has been pointed out that uh, she met Lee Harvey Oswald in uh, Minsk, the, the Soviet capital for espionage activity. Oh, I never heard it was that. You didn't know that? No. She was working as a pharmacist, mm -hmm. went there from Leningrad where she was raised. And he picks up the trail uh, late in 1962, I think, but he always seems to be one step behind Oswald, uh, and he does not succeed in catching up to him before Oswald leaves for uh, New Orleans in May. Mr. Monshield, do you feel that he was a friend or an enemy of President Kennedy? He, de we, he definitely was not an enemy. He was an admirer of President Kennedy. From his point of view, was an excellent president, and his ideas corresponded very well to President Kennedy's ideas, and vice versa. George de Morinchil was born in Russia. He finally came to the United States in 1938. He worked for the French intelligence services in New York City for a while. He got a master's degree in 1945 from the University of Texas at Austin, but he was never really very good at finding oil or dealing with oil. He was really a person who was for sale, very cosmopolitan, very charming, very good-looking, 
not very capable in any of the business ventures that he went into. A perfect person to be taken up by the intelligence services of a variety of countries, especially CIA. When Oswald returns from the Soviet Union, there's George de Morenschild, who was sent by J. Walton Moore of CIA to go visit this defector, Lee Harvey Oswald, who has come to Dallas and Fort Worth to live with his Russian wife, Marina. Suddenly, he's befriending this nondescript, impoverished, scruffy, down-at-the-heels ex-Marine Lee Oswald, who was a defector, no less, supposedly, to the Soviet Union. I interviewed George de Morenschild, who uh, was, it seems, Oswald's, quote, handler in CIA parlance uh, after Oswald returned from the Soviet Union. It's on record that he had been reporting, previously anyway, to J. Walton Moore, who was the domestic contacts division, as it was called, of the CIA based in Dallas. At the beginning of my acquaintanceship with Lee, I became somewhat alarmed by his extremist views and by the fact of his having the Nazi citizenship. And that's why, at the time, I asked a fellow connected either with FBI or CIA, I do not remember, what did you think of Harvey Lee Oswald? A harmless lunatic, he said. And after the assassination, he appeared to us as a patsy because he was a harmless lunatic. If he actually did it, he would have been probably proud of it because it was an important act, the most important act in the century. But he denied it till the last moment. And the last words he uttered were, I'm a patsy. De Morenschild then stays with Oswald until April of 1963. It fits perfectly when Oswald moves to New Orleans and de Morenschild takes up with another CIA acolyte, would be, and that was Claymore Joseph Charles, who was hoping CIA would help him to become president of the Republic of Haiti by overthrowing Francois Duvalier. As it stands now, Oswald was a lunatic who killed President Kennedy. Ruby was another lunatic who killed the lunatic who killed the president. And now we have the third lunatic, supposedly, Garrison, who tries to investigate this whole case. I think it's extremely insulting for the United States, this assumption that there are so many lunatics here. As you look back upon your first two years in office, sir, has your experience in the office matched your expectations? How has this worked out as you saw it in advance? Well, in the first place, I think the problems are more difficult than I had imagined uh, they were. Secondly, there's a limitation upon the ability of the United States to solve these problems. And I think that's probably true of anyone who becomes president, because there is such a difference between those who advise or speak or legislate and, be, and between the man who must uh, make, select from the various alternatives proposed and say that this shall be the policy of the United States, well, it's much easier to make the speeches than it is to finally make the judgments. Because uh, unfortunately, your advisors are frequently divided. If you take the wrong course, and on occasion I have, uh, the president bears the burden, responsibility quite rightly, the advisors may move on to new advice. Well, Mr. President, that brings up a point that's always interested me. How does a president go about making a decision, like Cuba, for example? The uh, most recent one was hammered out really our policy and decision over a period of uh, five or six days. During that period, the 15 people, more or less, who were directly consulted frequently uh, changed their view uh, because uh, whatever action we took had so many uh, disadvantages to it. And each action that we took raised the prospect that the it might escalate with the Soviet Union into a nuclear war. This government, as promised, has maintained the closest surveillance of the Soviet military buildup on the island of Cuba. Within the past week, unmistakable evidence has established the fact that a series of offensive missile sites is now in preparation on that imprisoned island. The purpose of these bases can be none other than to provide a nuclear strike capability against the Western Hemisphere. Each of these missiles, in short, is capable of striking Washington, D.C., Mexico City, or any other city in the southeastern part of the United States. This sudden, clandestine decision 
to station strategic weapons for the first time outside of Soviet soil is a deliberately provocative and unjustified change in the status quo, which cannot be accepted by this country. We will not prematurely or unnecessarily risk the course of worldwide nuclear war in which even the fruits of victory would be ashes in our mouth. But neither will we shrink from that risk at any time it must be faced. I think a general consensus developed uh, and certainly seemed after all alternatives were examined that the course of action that we finally adopted was the right one. If we had had to act on the Wednesday in the first 24 hours, I don't think probably we would have chosen as prudently as we finally did a quarantine against the use of offensive weapons. All ships of any kind bound for Cuba, from whatever nation or port, will, if found to contain cargoes of offensive weapons, be turned back. That had much more power than we first thought it did, because uh, I think the Soviet Union was very reluctant to have us stop ships which carried with them a good deal of their highly secret and sensitive material. It shall be the policy of this nation to regard any nuclear missile launched from Cuba against any nation in the Western Hemisphere as an attack by the Soviet Union on the United States, requiring a full retaliatory response upon the Soviet Union. I call upon Chairman Khrushchev to halt and eliminate this clandestine, reckless, and provocative threat to world peace and to stable relations between our two nations. He has an opportunity now to move the world back from the abyss of destruction. God willing, that goal will be achieved. Thank you and good night. At the United Nations, Ambassador Stevenson takes America's case to the world. He asks Russia's ambassador, Do you, Ambassador Zoran, deny that the USSR has placed and is placing medium and intermediate range missiles and sites in Cuba? Yes or no? <laughs> you will have your answer in due course. I'm prepared to wait for my answer until hell freezes over, if that's your decision. Men and women the world over hang on the news. No one can be sure that he and his family will still be alive at this time tomorrow. On Sunday morning, a message reaches the White House from Moscow. Chairman Khrushchev has agreed to remove the missiles from Cuba. One of the reasons I think that the Soviet Union withdrew the IL-28s was because we were carrying on very intensive low-level photography. Mr. Castro could not permit us to indefinitely continue widespread flights over his island at 200 feet every day. And yet he knew if he shot down one of our planes that uh, then it would bring back a much more serious reprisal on him. So it's very difficult to always make judgments here about what the effect will be of our decisions on other countries. In this case, it seemed to me that we did pick the right one. In Cuba of 1961, we picked the wrong one. I'm suggesting, Mr. President, there's a military plot to take over the government. This is the astounding story of a military plot to overthrow the government of the United States. I think the signing of a nuclear disarmament pact with the Soviet Union is at best an act of naivete and at worst an unsupportable negligence. You're not a weak sister, Mr. President. You're a criminally weak sister. Mr. President, uh... Well, I wonder if you will tell us what, uh, what your grounds, your investigations of the... Uh, Major General Ted Walker incident in Europe, if you will please tell us what grounds you found for relieving him of his command for allegedly teaching troops anti-communist doctrines. I, uh, and when I saw the stories in regard to uh, the uh, things which uh, had been said, or at least alleged to have been said in regard to General Walker, I called Secretary McNamara and asked him to investigate it. Secretary McNamara then, I believe, suspended uh, General Walker, and my term may not be precise, pending a completion of the investigation. General Edwin Walker had been relieved of command of a division in Germany by President Kennedy in the fall of 1961 because he had been handing out literature to his troops from the John Birch Society. 
He was an extreme right winger. He moved to Dallas. He started agitating against civil rights. And in fact, he went to Oxford, Mississippi in September 1962 to try to help stop the admission of James Meredith, the first Negro in the University of Mississippi. James H. Meredith is formally enrolled at the University of Mississippi, ending one chapter in the federal government's efforts to desegregate the university. The town of Oxford is an armed camp. Nearly 6,000 troops patrol Oxford to maintain order and arrests mount to more than 200. Former Major General Edwin Walker, who came here from his home in Texas, is put under arrest and held in high bail on charges of inciting insurrection. He was flown to a federal prison hospital as relative calm settled on the town in the greatest crisis the South has faced since the Civil War. I don't uh, really know uh, what other role uh, they would expect the President of the United States to play. The court, made up of Southern judges, determined that it was according to the Constitution that Mr. Meredith go to the University of Mississippi. The governor of Mississippi uh, did, opposed it, and uh, there was uh, rioting uh, against Mr. Meredith, which endangered his life. We sent in marshals, and after all, 150 or 60 marshals were wounded one way or another out of four or five hundred, and at least three-fourths of the marshals were from the South themselves. And then we sent in troops when it appeared that the marshals were going to be overrun. I don't think that uh, anybody who looks at the situation could think we could possibly do anything else. We could possibly do anything else. But on the other hand, I recognize that it's caused a lot of bitterness against uh, me and against the national government in Mississippi and other parts. I think there was good cause for the action that we took. I think there was good cause for him having a mental examination. Uh, he uh, took a long trip uh, uh, to uh, Oxford, Mississippi. Uh, he appeared on the campus during the course of the riot. Uh, there was a good deal of testimony about him leading charges against the United States Marshals. This is a former general of the United States. Uh, I think there was uh, probably a legitimate question whether uh, he had all his uh, faculties when he took that kind of action. Uh, we could not, in all conscience, have tried him if he uh, was not mentally competent. In early April, the first few days of April, 1963, Oswald apparently, uh, with his Mannlicher Carcano rifle that he had acquired some time earlier, took a shot at Walker when he was sitting in his house. General, will you describe for us just what happened last night? Well, the police from the city came in to investigate a rifle shot that was fired into the house fired through the west window and hit the cell and hit the wall across the room and went through the wall over the desk at which I was sitting. This happened at 9 o'clock last night. He missed. And apparently, after firing one shot, he fled. If Oswald had attempted to kill Walker with the same determination that he later decided to kill President Kennedy, Walker would have been dead. There was some belief among people who knew Walker that he had staged it to get good publicity. What also I find rather striking it was, is that it was only a few weeks earlier that Oswald had had Marina take the pictures of him outside their house, standing with his recently acquired rifle, his recently acquired pistol, and copies of The Worker, the Communist Party magazine, and the militant, the Socialist Workers Party, bi-weekly, I think. Had Oswald been caught, uh, Walker would indeed have been able to claim that an attempt had been made on his life by an obvious uh, communist and Trotskyite. But in fact, he was not caught, and instead, very shortly thereafter, he moved Marina and their child to his hometown in New Orleans. George de Mornschild and his wife had an original copy of the backyard photograph where Oswald is shown standing with the gun. It's part of the framing of Oswald, isn't it, though? If he could shoot General Walker, who's a general in the military services, why not shoot the head of state? Why not shoot President Kennedy? And we know from the evidence that we have that Oswald was actually a liberal and that he admired President Kennedy, and that he never said a word against President Kennedy. And in fact, I think the Oswalds talked about how Marina was pregnant at the same time that uh, Jacqueline Kennedy was pregnant when Jackie lost her baby Patrick. And so they felt they had something in common. They felt close to the president and his wife. This man has drawn attention to himself as a suspected narcotics addict, the kind of man the army has no need for. He and his friends have been kept under surveillance. 
Richard Nagel comes back to the U.S. and uh, he's working for the Alcohol Beverage Control Board in Los Angeles when in the late summer of 62 he goes back to work uh, for the CIA. He goes to Mexico City at the height of the Cuban Missile Crisis in the fall of 62 and uh, becomes involved in a double agent mission where he is told to approach the Soviets about offering them secrets, trying to win their confidence. He is then assigned by the KGB to, or the GRU, by Russian intelligence at any rate, to go, come back to the United States and do two things. First, monitor a rumored assassination plot against President Kennedy by a group of Cuban exiles connected to an organization called Alpha 66. Um, that are, are embittered over the fact that Kennedy, they, in their view, has sold them out over first the Bay of Pigs and then you know, making this deal that, with the Cuban Missile Crisis not to invade Cuba. Nagel's other assignment was to keep tabs on this guy named Lee Harvey Oswald who had recently returned from Russia with his wife and um, you know, check him out, see what he's doing. December 1962. President Kennedy met the ransomed Cuban invasion prisoners in the Orange Bowl. In December of 62, according to Nagel, there was a plot to put a bomb in or near the speaker's podium of the Orange Bowl in Miami when Kennedy was addressing the prisoners who had just been released from Cuba during the Bay of Pigs prisoner exchange. He gave them a promise which must have struck both fear and hatred in Castro's heart. I can assure you that this flag will be returned to this brigade in a free Havana. That was a plot by anti-Castro Cuban exiles. It did not go forward, obviously, for some reason. The young man I play is a fellow from Boston. His name, Lieutenant John F. Kennedy. Then in June of 63, Nagel says there was another plot to kill Kennedy at the premiere of the movie about his life, PT-109, in Beverly Hills in California. That also didn't go forward, but Nagel was involved in that plot, apparently as a monitor who had worked to enlist a guy named Vaughn Marlowe, who was involved with the Fair Play for Cuba Committee in Los Angeles. Then in the late summer of 63, Nagel says that's when Oswald was brought into the third plot, which was originally scheduled for Washington, D.C. or Baltimore, the end of September of 63. And Oswald was the necessary ingredient. He was the patsy. He was uh, convinced by these two anti-Castro Cuban exiles. And there was a guy from the CIA at these meetings, too, who used a code name, Raul, that they were actually Castro agents. And they were working for Fidel, and Fidel was very upset about these plots to assassinate him that were being orchestrated by the CIA and the Mafia and was out to make some kind of statement, some kind of revenge against Kennedy and Oswald was enlisted into a plot to kill JFK by these two Cubans who claimed they were Castro agents. Castro would welcome him in Cuba as a revolutionary hero if he indeed took part in this uh, plot in some fashion. Leopoldo and Angel were war names, as, it's, as they were called, for uh, anti-Castro Cuban exiles who were looking to get rid of Fidel one way or another. So Nagel was ordered by the Russians to either convince Oswald he was being set up or kill him in Mexico City at the end of September 63. Well, Nagel didn't do that. He did meet with Oswald in Jackson Square in New Orleans and um, try to talk him out of this. But for whatever reason, Oswald couldn't be talked out of it. Nagel then took himself out of the picture. First, he sent a registered letter to J. Edgar Hoover of the FBI, giving the FBI enough information that, to warrant the arrest of Oswald and these two Cuban exiles. Hoover claimed he never got that letter, never saw it, obviously did nothing to uh, head this off in advance. Nagel also sent a registered letter to people in, inside the CIA, probably to Desmond Fitzgerald, who he was ultimately reporting to, who was running the CIA's Cuban affairs program at the time in Washington. And then he took himself out of the picture by walking into that bank in El Paso. I did have a fascinating interview with the 
police officer, Jim Bundren. He was a young cop at the time, I think he was 23. He got Officer of the Year for heroically arresting Nagel outside the El Paso Bank where Nagel was waiting to be arrested. And uh, what he told me was that he was sitting with Nagel in the courtroom about three weeks before the assassination. And he looked at Nagel and he said, uh, you didn't really try to rob that bank, did you? And Nagel said, no, oh, you're a pretty smart cop, aren't you? And uh, Nagel said, well, I'll just tell you this, I wouldn't want to be in Dallas right now. Now, Bundren never forgot that, and he never talked about it publicly until the day I interviewed him. But it had haunted this policeman ever since. On the day of the assassination, Nagel had asked to speak to the Secret Service as soon as possible, and he did. And he spoke to the FBI, the CIA was sending people to interview him in jail. A lot of those files have still never been released. Now, Oswald's a real mystery. I mean, I believe, or Nagel believed, that he was a sincere Trotskyite leftist. Even though he had connections with the CIA, the CIA was using him in certain ways, certainly to penetrate the Fair Play for Cuba committee that Oswald set up this phony chapter of in New Orleans. Um, also the FBI, Oswald reported to the FBI sometimes as a confidential informant. So a lot of people believe he was really a CIA agent or operative in some way, uh, or an FBI guy. And maybe he could, it could be said he was. But at the same time, he was working for the other side. Who he was really loyal to, I don't know. I don't know that we'll ever know. Nagel thought that he was willing to take part in this as a so-called Castro agent. It is readily foreseeable that a coming economic, political, or military crisis will bring about the final destruction of the capitalist system. We have no interest in violently opposing the U.S. government or directly assuming power in such a crisis. As dissident Americans, we are opposed to foreign intervention, with a new democratic socialist society as our goal. No man, having lived under both the Russian communist and American capitalist societies, could possibly choose between the two. One offers oppression, the other offers poverty. Both offer imperialistic injustice, two brands of slavery. But no rational man can say, a curse on both your houses. A truly democratic system would combine the best qualities of the two on an American foundation, opposing the two systems as they are now. This, then, is our ideal. Mr. Oswald, what is the Athean system you propose? The Athean system is a new political philosophy opposed to communism, socialism, and capitalism. Democracy at a local level with no centralized state. Nationalism, fascism, and racial segregation will all be abolished from everyday life with free medical care and free compulsory education until 18 years old. War propaganda and weapons of mass destruction will be forbidden, and we will abolish all armies except a civil police force with small arms. Rifles will only be sold with police permission. Mr. Oswald, how will the economy function under such a system? We will guarantee the right to free collective enterprise. Unlike communism, individuals will own private property and conduct small business. But unlike capitalism, all surplus profits will be shared equally by the collective enterprise. Monopoly practices will be banned as capitalistic. Nationalization will be banned as communistic. No taxes will be levied against individuals, but heavy graduated taxes will be levied against all surplus profits, such taxes being used solely for the building and improvement of public projects. Few Americans have as many personal reasons to know and therefore hate and mistrust communism. But I would never jump on the anti-communist bandwagon because our two countries have too much to offer each other to be tearing at each other's throats in an endless cold war. Capitalism doesn't work. Communism doesn't work. And socialism doesn't work. In returning to the US, I have chosen the lesser of two evils. Americans are apt to scoff the idea that a military coup, as so often happens in the Latin American countries, could ever replace our government here in the U.S. But it is an idea that has grounds for consideration. The case of General Walker shows that the army is not fertile ground for a far-right regime to prosper. 
but the U.S. Marine Corps is a right-wing infiltrated organization with dire potential consequences for freedom in the United States. Only in this country is the voice of dissent allowed opportunity of expression. I have done a lot of criticizing of our system tonight, but I hope it will be taken in the spirit in which it was given. After Oswald's defection to the Soviet Union and all the things that happened in connection with that, I think the most outstanding piece of his history or his story is when he goes Cuban in early 1963, he's still in Dallas, Texas. In his files that were manipulated in the context of the assassination of the president and just before that in Mexico City, the Soviet story seemed to be just fine. But what was missing was the entire Oswald Cuba Castro story. And that begins early in 1963, while he's still in Dallas, and then develops over the summer as he moves to New Orleans. In New Orleans again, he establishes a chapter of the so-called Fair Play for Cuba Committee. Carrying in his pocket a Fair Play for Cuba membership card, he begins to distribute the organization's literature. And the real question is, why did he do that? This is a major decision point in his life. The question is, did he do that on his own? Is he suddenly in love with Castro? Or did somebody who was handling him uh, in a plot, which by this time would have been fairly well developed to kill the president of the United States? It's in New Orleans that Oswald's apparent leftist activism really takes off. He writes the head of the Fair Play for Cuba Committee, V.T. Lee, in New York, and announces that he wants to set up a chapter. And I think Lee clearly concluded this guy was nothing but trouble and probably a provocateur. So Oswald gets several hundred leaflets printed up, and he starts handing out leaflets. And he hands out a lot of leaflets. There is no evidence that he made even a single convert to his cause. However, there may have been other reasons for doing this. Now, what we didn't know until relatively recently is that the Fair Play for Cuba Committee, along with the Communist Party and the Socialist Workers Party, was a major target of the FBI's COINTELPRO program, which was a counterintelligence program started in the 50s designed to disrupt and embarrass these organizations by infiltrating them, by starting feuds inside them, and by getting derogatory information about them into the press. This is a story, a fantastically true story, from the files of Herbert A. Philbrick, who for nine frightening years did lead three lives. Citizen, communist, counter-spy. This week, Herbert Philbrick brings you the story of a counter-spy who uncovered a communist plan of converting a simple household appliance into a means of destroying American air defenses. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Herbert A. Philbrick. The communists are past masters at getting other people to do their dirty work for them. They take over organization after organization in America in just two steps, infiltration and agitation. It's an international criminal conspiracy. In August, after he's been doing this for months, things go into a new phase. He makes contact with an anti-Castro Cuban group, the DRE, and particularly with a young DRE man named Carlos Bringuer. Mr. Oswald came to my office here in the city of New Orleans and offered me his service as ex-marine of the United States. He can show us how to fight because he has a guerrilla training and he was uh, likely to see Cuba free from Castro. And then a few days later, some Cubans reportedly run into Bringuer's store and tell him there's a guy handing out pro-Castro leaflets around the corner. And they run around, and there's Oswald handing out leaflets, and they have a big public confrontation, almost amounting to a fight. The police are called, three of them are arrested, and it gets into the newspapers. Now, the scene on Canal Street looks as if it were staged. And it turns out that Oswald wrote a letter talking about an incident where they, he had a fight with Bringier on Canal Street a week before the incident happens. So the whole thing was phony. It was fake. And Bringier played a part in that. Bringier then was interviewed by Garrison several times and reported he was an informant to FBI, he was an informant to CIA, linked with Oswald forever after. The news department of a New Orleans radio and television station, WDSU-TV, 
brings to the public the opposing views of the thousands of Cuban refugees who have settled in New Orleans and the Fair Play for Cuba Committee, represented by Lee Harvey Oswald. I think that the, uh, the uh, red herring and so forth is rather uh, uh, ridiculous to toss into this conversation. And are you a Marxist? Well, I have uh, studied Marxist philosophy, yes, sir, and also other philosophers. But are you a Marxist? I think you did admit on an earlier radio interview that you, uh, that you consider yourself a Marxist. Oh, I would very definitely say that I, uh, I uh, am a Marxist. That is correct. But I, that does not mean, however, that I'm a, a uh, communist. What is the difference between the two? Well, there's a great deal of difference. Such, several uh, American parties in several countries are based on Marxism, such as Ghana. Uh, Ghana. Uh, certain countries have uh, characteristics uh, of a socialist system, such as Great Britain with its uh, socialized medicine. Uh, these, then, are the differences between an outright communist country and countries which adhere to leftist or Marxist uh, uh, principles. In your work with the Fair Play for Cuba Committee, uh, what are you advocating? We advocate restoration of diplomatic trade and tourist relations with Cuba. Arrangements are made to present on the station's conversation carte blanche program a debate between Oswald and an official of INCA, INCA, the Information Council of the Americas. It is on this program, broadcast only 93 days before the assassination of President Kennedy, that Oswald confronts the only free world propaganda specialist he is ever to meet in open debate. The man, Edward Scannell Butler. In the studios, Carlos Bringier, moderator Bill Stuckey, and WDSU newsman Bill Slatter, Oswald, and myself sat around a small studio table. I sat on Oswald's left, less than a foot away. After introducing Oswald and describing the pro-Castro activities of the Fair Play for Cuba Committee, Stuckey said, We, uh, Mr. Butler, brought uh, some newspaper clippings to my attention, and I also found some through an independent uh, investigation, uh, Washington newspaper clippings, to the effect that Mr. Oswald had attempted to renounce his American citizenship in 1959 and become a Soviet citizen. Uh, there was another clipping dated 1952 saying that uh, uh, Mr. Oswald had returned from the Soviet Union with his wife and child after having lived there for three years. Mr. Oswald, are these correct? That is uh, correct, yes. You did live in Russia for three years? That is correct, and I think the fact that I did uh, live for a time in the Soviet Union gives me excellent qualifications to uh, repudiate charges that Cuba and the Fair Play for Cuba Committee is communist control. I would like to know exactly the name of the organization that you represent here in the city, because I have some confusion. Is it Fair Play for Cuba Committee or Fair Play for Russia Committee? Well, that is, of course, very provocative and uh, uh, question, I don't think it, it requires an answer. And Oswald went on the radio, and at one point, I think everybody knows that moment when Oswald sort of says he was employed by CIA and then cuts himself short. He sort of had a, a slip of the tongue there, if we want to call it a Freudian slip. I'm curious to know just how you supported yourself during the three years that you lived in the Soviet Union. Did you have a government subsidy? I worked in Russia. Uh, I was under uh, the protection of the uh, of the, uh, I was, that is to say, I was not under the protection of the uh, American government, but that is, I was uh, at all times uh, considered an American citizen. The FBI's handling of the Fair Play for Cuba Committee incident is rather interesting. This is a known Communist Front organization and a major target of the FBI. And here is a guy claiming to have started a chapter. Uh, he is also, when he was arrested, he's asked to see an FBI agent, and uh, an agent named Quigley comes over, and he claims to have a chapter, including 20 members. Now, neither Quigley nor any other FBI agent ever says or indicates this guy is obviously making it all up. And yet, they don't seem to be very curious about the whole thing at all. They are asked to report on it by Washington, and eventually they, sin they submit very brief pro forma reports, and that's all. I certainly get the feeling, looking at the paper record, the FBI knows that this guy Oswald is not someone to worry about as a genuine subversive. What was Oswald's motivation? What made him tick? It is my belief that Oswald staged the whole Fair Play for Cuba Committee episode as part of COINTELPRO. I don't think he was working for the FBI directly. A lot of COINTELPRO was subcontracted to the American Legion and various other right-wing groups. 
including the one Ed Butler worked for, the Information Council of the Americas. Must we mobilize a vast private army of secret agents to compete with communism? So when Oswald first arrives in New Orleans, what does he do? He goes to 544 Camp Street or 531 Lafayette, depending on which door you go in, and he goes into the office of Guy Bannister, former special agent in charge of the FBI field office in Chicago, now running a detective agency in New Orleans and a CIA operative of high level, and he asks for a job. And one day, the secretary, I think, said to Guy Bannister, look, there's your friend uh, Oswald giving out pro-Castro leaflets downstairs. And Guy Bannister brushed that aside and said, he's one of ours. So Oswald was doing his best to keep up his cover. CIA had a plan to blame Castro for the assassination and to make Oswald the agent of Fidel Castro, in particular the great propaganda specialist of CIA, David Atlee Phillips, who was also Oswald's handler, as we know from Antonio Vesiana, who testified he saw Oswald with his own handler, whose name was Morris Bishop. Yo tuve que ir a Dallas por, tenía alguna frecuencia, yo tenía una prima mía que trabajaba allí en una compañía, y yo Ahora está casualmente viviendo en Europa, en Holanda. Y yo la iba a visitar alguna vez. Y él sabía, y entonces me dijo que nos íbamos a encontrar en Holanda. Y me, me citó en, un, en el lobby de un hotel en el downtown de Dallas. Cuando yo llegué, él estaba acompañado de una persona joven. Y fue una, una cosa de cinco minutos, algo así. Y yo sí vi que era un hombre taciturno, un hombre que no hablaba, etc. Pero yo no sé por qué estaba acompañado de, 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 de Bishop en ese momento. Después, cuando vino el asesinato, enseguida me di cuenta quién era. So, do you think Bishop was involved in the assassination? I really, I don't know, but I think according to the investigators, that there was a conspiracy, if it was a conspiracy, it was the people that worked for the CIA in that time that were very angry with, with, with the President of the United States. Having played out the string in New Orleans, he arranges for Ruth Payne, who had befriended Marina, to come and pick up Marina and the baby and take them back to Dallas. And he decides to go to Mexico City to try to get into Cuba. I had, as I've already said, known them here in Dallas before they moved to New Orleans, where he got work over the summer. Mm -hmm. Stopped by and saw them in New Orleans coming home from a vacation trip and found he was out of work again. She was just a month away from delivering a baby. And I suggested that since she could get uh, county care here, as they qualified as one-year residents here in Texas, that it would be better for her to come here and I could help make the necessary arrangements uh, it would be necessary, of course, to translate mm -hmm. so that she could be uh, admitted to a hospital. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, Lee Oswald was somewhat relieved to, uh, to accept that suggestion. And it was then that I first felt he cared for his family. It was the first I had seen that he really did care and was interested in their welfare. At the same time that he's supposed to be showing up in Mexico City, these two Cuban exiles, anti-Castro Cubans, knock on the door of a woman in Dallas named Sylvia Odio with a guy named, they identify as Leon Oswald. I was visited by a man and uh, two other men, but specifically Lee Harvey Oswald, even though he introduced himself as Leon Harvey Oswald at the time. You have no doubt at all in your mind, now or then, that this was Lee Harvey Oswald? Oh, no, not at all. He was Lee Harvey Oswald. Leon Oswald doesn't say anything in the doorway, but Leopoldo, one of these two Cubans, calls her later and says, well, what did you think of the American? The first thing he said was, what do you think of the American? And I said, well, I didn't think very much. I didn't make an opinion. He says, well, you know, he's kind of loco. Loco means crazy in Spanish and kind of nuts. And uh, he has, he's a Marine, an ex-Marine. He's an expert marksman and uh, he would be a tremendous asset to anyone. So uh, this guy, Leopoldo, insisted that uh, the American had said that we Cubans should have shot President Kennedy after Bay of Pigs, that we didn't have any guts. 
and that we should do something like that. So immediately I realized that there was an assassination idea or plot. So there's this trail being blazed to set this guy up for something at the same time he's going to the Cuban and Russian consulates in Mexico City, or somebody is. There's obvious, obviously two people here. There's an Oswald impersonator at work because it, the timetable doesn't work. The Warren Commission says, okay, well, he's on a bus set to Mexico at the time he's supposedly showing up at the door of Sylvia Odio. I still believe that he had nothing to do with, um, with Cuba, with Fidel Castro. I still believe that he has something to do with sources within the United States using perhaps Cubans in this conspiracy. And I still believe that it is a conspiracy. Leopoldo and Angel were war names, as, it's, as they were called, for uh, anti-Castro Cuban exiles who were looking to get rid of Fidel one way or another. Their true identities, they're still a mystery. Many years go by trying to identify those Cubans. And at the end of 2004, I guess, I went to Miami and I was introduced to a man named Angelo Murgado, whose name became Angelo Kennedy because he worked for Bobby Kennedy in his anti-Castro operations. And he was so admired, the Kennedys, especially Bobby, that he changed his name to Kennedy. And he told me how he was one of the Cubans who knocked on Sylvia Odio's door and saw Oswald there and how he was with a person named Bernardo de Torres, who was a person who worked for Garrison for a time, was a CIA person, was a member of the Bay of Pigs, Brigade 2506, and Bernardo de Torres, known as Bernie to these people, was the Leopoldo. And Angelo was so upset because he loved the Kennedys, and here he's playing a part in the framing of the man who would ultimately be accused, at least, of killing President Kennedy. And as far as Angelo knew, Oswald did kill President Kennedy. And he was overwhelmed by this. When I went to interview him, he still was upset. All those years later, how could he know that Bernardo de Torres set him up and made him part of the assassination plot against President Kennedy that CIA was running? And Angelo Murgado had told me that he was aware of Oswald earlier in the summer of 1963 because Bobby sent his group to see what Oswald was doing in New Orleans and realizing that something is wrong with this person and not knowing what and reporting to Bobby Kennedy. And then Bobby said, well, the FBI has him under control, so we don't have to worry. Oswald slipped out of his hands. And with Oswald slipping out of his hands, the plot slipped out of their hands and they never uncovered it. It seems that the two Latins were Lauren Hall, who actually was an American, although he could speak Spanish, and Larry Howard, who was a Mexican-American, who could speak very good Spanish, right-wing exile mercenaries. And they wanted to know what Jure was up to in Dallas, basically, and, and they wanted her help in doing their own fundraising. I am a Cuban freedom fighter. Cuba today could be free. But under the Kennedy administration, they do not want the Cuban people free, for they themselves are pro-socialist and pro-communist. Now, it turns out that Hall and Howard had been in Dallas for about five days, staying in a motel. They'd been driving from California and they had a Cuban with them. And again, on the day that Hall met Odio with Oswald, he had spoken to Robert Morris, the right-wing activist, three times. As I understand, uh, not so long before the killing of President Ken Kennedy in Dallas, you have been arrested in Dallas or interrogated. Yes, I, uh, I had hauled a load of arms in a trailer from Los Angeles uh, en route to Miami, Florida, or en route to the Keys so we could make our raids into Cuba. And we stopped off in Dallas and deposited these uh, arms in a home in the Dallas area. And that was Mr. Logue's home? Uh, I'll say that, uh, that I uh, deposited the, the arms in a home in, in, in the Dallas area. Yes. You were actually imprisoned? Yes. For how long? Uh, I was in uh, jail, I think it was for two days. How did you get out? Mr. Logue bailed me out for $5,000. Now, why would he do that? Well, number one, he had some things of mine out at his house. Oh, yes, we discussed and, that uh, before. Uh, he was a friend of mine, and uh, he wanted me out of the area. Are you still in contact with Mr. Lowe? No, I'm not. Why would that not be? Because I'm not in contact with anybody from Texas. 
you uh, give the impression that you wouldn't like to go to Texas at this point. Well, if I wanted to commit suicide, uh, I would probably go to Dallas, Texas. Can you tell us about your meeting in Mr. Loke's office in Dallas about soliciting funds for Cuba? <coughs> Pardon me. Yes, we, uh, I was in the office. There was uh, five other gentlemen along with Mr. Logan and myself that was in the office. And we were talking about donating uh, $2,000 apiece towards a $20,000 fund so that we could form a government in exile, a Cuban government in exile, and for pulling raids in Cuba. And one of the gentlemen that was there that was in the trucking business stated that rather than donate $2,000 for the raids into Cuba and for forming a government uh, in exile, he would rather donate to a $50,000 fund and have uh, Kennedy's head blowed off. Uh, he aimed this towards me. Uh, I got up and told him that uh, I wanted no part of it, that uh, I, I might break the Neutrality Act and, uh, and pull raids into Cuba and fight the communists, but that there's no way that I would ever murder anybody or have anything to do with it. Mr. Logue also jumped up and he told him never, never, to uh, bring that subject up in, in his office again, that he wanted no part of any conversation such as this. Years later in the mid-70s, where there's so much interest in all these matters, and Hall testifies for the Assassinations Committee, he's also contacted by a reporter from the National Enquirer named Weberman by phone. Right as it stands right now, there's only two of us left alive. That's me and Senator Traficani. And as far as I'm concerned, we're both going to stay alive because I ain't going to say shit. The only thing I'm saying is any of you assholes come near me, you better have a fucking army with you, baby, because I've got my shit together and I'll blow the first one of you motherfuckers away that even comes near me. And that you can put in print. There's a slight gap in his movements between about the 23rd of September and the early morning of the 26th of September when he does turn up on a bus south of Houston on the way to Mexico. But he goes to Mexico to try to get into Cuba. And here again, we find the same pattern because he goes to the Cuban consulate and he meets a Mexican woman, Sylvia Duran, who is working for the consulate and whose job is to hand out these visas. I'm a friend of the Cuban Revolution. I lived in Russia for three years and have a Russian wife. And I was the delegate for the Fair Play for Cuba Committee in New Orleans and a member of the Communist Party. Oswald has brought his dossier as a friend to Fidel, uh, the clipping about his arrest in New Orleans and some of his Fair Play for Cuba Committee stuff and his membership card. And as she explained years later, this just doesn't look right. A genuine FPCC person, a genuine sympathizer, goes to the headquarters of the Communist Party in New York or contacts them, gets vetted. They write a letter to her and she's all set but him, she's never heard of. When do you intend to go to Cuba? On Monday, for two weeks, and then on to Russia. For a transit visa first, you need a visa from the Soviet Union. So he says, OK. And he hustles over to the Soviet embassy, and he sees someone there. All visa matters must be handled by the embassy in your country of residence, Mr. Oswald. I already sent them a letter, and they turned me down. The FBI could arrest me for even contacting your embassy in Washington, so I decided to come to Mexico to apply again here. Well, if you want to fill out the papers, I can make an exception for you and send them directly to Moscow. But the answer will be sent to your permanent residence and will take at least four months. This won't do for me. This is not my case. For me, it's all going to end in tragedy. Now, typically, he goes right back to Duran and he bluffs. They approved my visa. Can you show me the papers, please? I don't have them with me. So she calls them. And, thank heaven, we have the tape of that call. And, and the tape of that call was probably the biggest single factor in not allowing this to lead to war with Cuba or the Soviet Union or whatever. It's clear they don't trust Oswald, he's not working for Oswald, and he's not going to get the visa. They have to wait for Washington. It might take four to five months. I went to jail in New Orleans for the Cuban Revolution. I deserve a visa. My Mexican visa expires on Monday. I can't wait that long. And he keeps trying to get the Russian visa for a few days, but it doesn't work. Hello again. I'm a communist. 
than I was the delegate for the Fair Play for Cuba committee in New Orleans. I carried out a secret mission that may be of interest to you. I'm under constant surveillance in the United States, persecuted. The FBI, they interrogate my neighbors, question my wife, and I even lose jobs because they come to my employers and ask questions. I'm afraid that they'll kill me. You have to let me in. The story of Oswald and Mexico City is one of the most difficult and arcane stories in the Kennedy assassination. Somebody down there, either Oswald or somebody impersonating him, had an experience that's very, very difficult to explain. My explanation is that uh, the story reflects a failure in the primary mission, which was that the Oswald or the Oswald character was supposed to be able to get to Cuba ostensibly on his way to the Soviet Union, but to get to Cuba to help cement this story that they were putting into the files that Oswald was connected to Castro, working for Castro when he killed Kennedy. When that failed, ostensibly because he couldn't get the visas from the Soviets or from the Cubans to do it, they had to come up with a plan B. And this was the phone conversations where he uh, says his name on the phone. He mentions the name of the Soviet assassinations guy, Kostikov. And it's been one of the most closely guarded secrets all these years of the Central Intelligence Agency. The Soviet embassy in Mexico City was one of the two centers of Soviet espionage in the Western Hemisphere. It was very closely watched by the CIA, which was tapping its phones, and by the FBI. We also have clear evidence that the CIA would use clandestine techniques to try to identify people who had called the Soviet embassy or the Cuban embassy without identifying themselves. And it seems the CIA used an operative, two operatives actually, on Saturday to call the Soviet embassy to impersonate this mysterious American and Sylvia Duran. The woman identifies herself as Duran, but Duran swore again and again that she wasn't in the consulate on Saturday, and even if she were, she would never have seen uh, somebody from off the street on a Saturday because the consulate was technically closed. Now, I think somehow the CIA did learn that it was Lee Harvey Oswald who had been in the consulate. So again, they have the same person uh, who speaks terrible Russian. This is one of the giveaways, because Oswald spoke pretty decent Russian. After all, he'd lived in the Soviet Union for almost three years. So they have somebody call a couple days later, early in the next week, and say, this is Lee Oswald. And at that point, they can send the cable to Washington, which the FBI is always delighted to get, uh, saying that uh, Lee Oswald called the Soviet embassy on such and such a date and asked about his visa. I don't think this was just Oswald's idea. I think it was somebody else's, a handler. And of all the characters that I can think of likely to have done that, it would be David Atlee Phillips. At some time just prior to Oswald's trip to Mexico City, Phillips becomes head of Cuban operations. He had been in charge of covert action down there, but at the time that Oswald shows up, six weeks before the murder of the president, there's David Atlee Phillips, chief of Cuban operations. It was my job to know what went on inside the Cuban embassy. And I was able to watch the activities of, of a strange tourist, Lee Harvey Oswald. He wanted to go to Cuba and he wanted to go to the Soviet Union. But the Cubans and the Soviets thought that Oswald was a kook and they rebuffed him and he went back to Dallas alone uh, on a bus. What Phillips does at that time period is extremely important, extremely interesting. And he takes a TDY to headquarters CI at exactly the time that the station in Mexico City is discussing with headquarters those telephone calls, those activities of Oswald in Mexico City. To the best of my recollection, there was something indicating in the translation this guy speaking terrible Russian. All right. My name is Lee Henry Oswald. All right. Have you had any word about me, about my visa? I'm not positive. Something along this line. Right. Uh, some sort of indication that he expected, hoped, to travel to Cuba with the idea of going on to the Soviet Union. Right. If this had been 
under different circumstances, I would have drawn the inference that he was up to some sort of espionage, something very serious. From a man who just telephones to Soviet embassy, I would gather he was someone who was naive and didn't know that someone was probably listening to him. And I didn't, I never heard the tape, so I don't know what the inflection was. Those files were manipulated as part of a story to set him up linking him to Castro. And again, I'm looking at David Atlee Phillips. I know of no evidence to indicate that Lee Harvey Oswald was in any way connected with the CIA. Those people who believe that the Cubans or the Soviets may have hired him as an assassin should remember that he wrote a letter to the FBI in Dallas just before the assassination threatening to blow up the Dallas police station. Hired assassins don't do that sort of thing. <laughs> Did Lee Harvey Oswald himself live here in this house uh, with, uh, with you and the, other, the rest of the Oswald family? No, he never stayed here. His wife was here from the end of September till the time of the shooting. Uh, but he visited perhaps several weekends during that time and stayed over the night mm -hmm. when he came out then. But he had a room in town. I never did know the address, in fact, of the room where he stayed. Mm -hmm. Well, why, why was it that Mrs. Oswald and the children stayed here and Lee Harvey Oswald stayed in Dallas? Well, they were having financial difficulties at the time. After Hosty learned that Oswald had spoken to the Soviets in Mexico City, uh, he discovered that Marina, at any rate, was uh, living with Ruth Bain, who was also separated from her husband, in Irving. The FBI had been here, is that correct, at your residence, mm -hmm. uh, to visit, apparently, either Marina Oswald or Lee Harvey Oswald, or both. What was the occasion of their visit? Well, the uh, agent expressed to me that it was routine for them to come to people who had come to live in this country from countries behind the Iron Curtain. Mm -hmm. Perhaps a year after these people have been in this country, they come to say that if uh, any blackmail pressure is being put to bear on relatives back home, or if they feel any such pressure, they have the right to come and talk with the FBI about it. And he finds out that Oswald is now working at the Texas School Book Depository, and then he drops it. On about November 12th, Oswald presents himself at the FBI office in Dallas with a note for Hostie. And it essentially orders Hostie to stop bothering my wife and if you do this again, I will blow up the FBI. Hostie claimed after the assassination that he did not realize when he saw that note that it was from Oswald. However, the secretary, uh, who apparently also saw it and spoke to Oswald, said that it was signed by Oswald and that it was clear it was Oswald. Do you feel that Lee Harvey Oswald was un under any kind of surveillance during that period by the government? I wouldn't I can't help but wonder if Oswald's name is on some list at Bureau headquarters as someone who is known to be some kind of operative, although not necessarily an operative for the FBI himself, itself, so that we, we no longer need to treat him as a potential spy. I was Fidel Castro's first American prisoner. On July 23, 1959, I was arrested with my son Edward, who at that time was 13 years of age. He was released after being held five days while I spent 40 months in Castro's communist dungeons. I was released on October the 7th, 1962. Here are some of the details of my story. John Martino was an associate of Sano Traficante whose specialty was making gambling equipment that could be used to cheat the customers. He had worked in the Havana casinos. In 1959, after Castro's takeover, he had gone to Havana apparently to help smuggle some money out, which was a big problem for the mob at that point. And he was arrested and tried and given a long prison sentence. He managed to secure his release in 1962. And he came back, resettled in Florida, and immediately got involved in any Castro activities. Martino then published a book, and he went on a book tour promoting it, which took him both to New Orleans and in the first few days of October 1963, to Dallas. The Martino family were news junkies. Every night while eating dinner, they would watch both Cronkite and the Huntley Brinkley Report, which apparently didn't run at the same time. 
And at some point, one of those commentators, according to Ed Martino, referred to President Kennedy's forthcoming trip to Dallas. And John Martino said, if he goes to Dallas, they're going to kill him. I turned on the television immediately in the morning when I got up, knowing that uh, the president was going to be in Fort Worth. And then I had to leave to take my little girl to a dentist appointment and left the TV on, although Marina was not yet up. I knew that she would want to see it too. I knew she liked the president very much. She thanked me when I got home, said that she'd wakened in a bad mood, but uh, was so glad to see President Kennedy when he arrived at the airport here that her uh, mood was buoyed up and she felt very good. Friday, 10 minutes before noon. The motorcade begins the 11 mile ride to the Dallas Trademark, where the president is to deliver a major address. On the morning of the 22nd, at breakfast, Martino looked over at his son Ed and said, Edward, I don't think you look very well today. I think you ought to stay home from school. Keep your eye on the news. I'm going to be out in the garage uh, doing some work there, and if there's any news, come out and tell me about it. In a downtown building, a gunman waits at a sixth floor window, a high-powered rifle by his side. The president's car is now turning onto Elm Street, and it will be only a matter of minutes before he arrives at the trademark. It it appears as though something has happened in the motorcade route. Something, I repeat, has happened in the motorcade route. There's numerous people running up the hill alongside Elm Street, there by the Stimmons Freeway. Several police officers are rushing up the hill at this time. Stand by just a moment, please. Parkland Hospital has been advised to stand by for a severe gunshot wound. The president's car is now going past me. The limousine is now traveling at a very high rate of speed, Secret Service men standing up in the limousine. They are armed with submachine guns. It appears as though someone in the limousine might have been hit by the gunfire. The presidential car coming up now. We know it's the presidential car. You can see Mrs. Kennedy's pink suit. There's a Secret Service man spread eagle over the top of the car. We can't see who has been hit, if anybody's been hit, but apparently something is wrong here. Something is terribly wrong. President Kennedy has been assassinated. It's official now. The president is dead. Women here in shock, some fainted. Grown men, Secret Service men standing by the emergency room, tears streaming down their face. There's only one word to describe the picture here, and that's grief, and much of it. It's official, as of just a few moments ago. The President of the United States is dead. Uh, we were both sitting here on the sofa watching the television when the news came that he had been shot. And Finally, we did hear that uh, the president was dead. She said to me, what a terrible thing this is for Mrs. Kennedy, and how sad that now the children will have to grow up without a father. Martino's son, Ed, who was a high school senior at the time, did come out and tell him that the president had been shot. His father took the news quietly. Then his father came back into the house and began working the phones, trying to link Oswald to Fidel Castro. Late word just in from Dallas, homicide detective Lavelle told WBAP newsman James Kerr in Dallas a few minutes ago, they have little doubt that 24-year-old Lee Oswald of Dallas is the man who shot and killed Dallas police officer J.D. Tippett shortly after President Kennedy was shot to death this afternoon. Oswald was pulled screaming and shouting from the Texas theater by officers who had gone there on a tip that Oswald was there. He brandished a pistol which officers took away from him after a struggle. Oswald was quoted as saying, it's all over now. A large crowd had congregated around the theater and police had to hold back the crowds because they were of the impression that the man was the president's assassin. Officer Tipper had been killed by a man answering the description of Oswald in the neighborhood a short time before. The coincidence in the case is that Oswald worked as a stockman at the Texas Book Depository, the building from which the sniper shot President Kennedy. Dallas police have declined to say whether they think Oswald is connected with the assassination. This is the part of the plot that went awry. In my opinion, Oswald was supposed to have a rendezvous after the assassination, at which point he would have been murdered and his body would have disappeared. Then, rumors would have spread of a mysterious private plane flying from Texas into Mexico City just in time to catch the plane to Havana, triggering an invasion of Cuba. Now, in fact, Lyndon Johnson, we now know, 
was very concerned that he was going to be forced into war by the assassination. Oswald's presence in the Cuban consulate in the Soviet embassy was enough to set off alarm bells, but instead he appointed the Warren Commission to reassure the American people that there was nothing more to this. Martino did confess his role in the assassination to at least two people. One was a newspaper reporter uh, for Newsday, I believe, named John Cummings. Cummings told me actually he once met Senator Traficante in Martino's kitchen in Miami. And Martino had told him that he had helped put the assassination together. And he also told him that Oswald was supposed to be meeting another conspirator in the Texas theater. The plan was to eliminate Oswald and that Oswald would uh, disappear. There is uh, some additional background on this suspect who has been picked up in Dallas, Frank. Uh, according to a man from the Cuban Student Directory in New Orleans, this man Oswald was in New Orleans two months ago as the chairman of a pro-Castro Fair Play for Cuba Committee. A member of the Information Council of the Americas, Edward Butler, said he and Oswald once debated communism. He said that Oswald had renounced U.S. citizenship, went to the Soviet Union to marry a Russian. Has he made any admissions at all about no. the shooting of the police officer? No, Nothing. he denies everything. Mm -hmm. why, why do you think the police officer well, went to him in the street? What were the reasons? I think he suspected him because of a description that had been put out on the radio. Against the wall. Right. These people have given me a hearing without legal representation or anything. You shoot the president? I didn't shoot anybody, no, sir. Here comes a man again. Here we go. Can I get one shot out? Can I get one statement, please? I'd like some legal representation. These police officers have not allowed me to, to have any. I, uh, I don't know what this is all about. I killed the president. Black guy. No, sir, I didn't. People How'd keep you get the black guy? Sir? Did you shoot the president? I work in that building. Were you in the building at the time? Naturally, if I work in that building, yes, sir. Back up, man. Did you on, shoot man. the president? No, they're taking me in because of the fact that I lived in the Soviet Union. What time did you leave the I'm just a patsy. the president? Mr. Wade, yes, sir. do you expect a confession from this man? No. Would you say it's a strong case, Mr. Wade? I think it's sufficient. The suspect is coming down the aisle and into identification room. I positively know nothing about this situation here. I would like to have re uh, legal representation. Well, I was uh, questioned by a judge. However, I uh, protested at that time that I was not allowed legal representation uh, during that, uh, that uh, very short and sweet hearing. Uh, I really don't know what the, what the situation is about. Nobody has told me anything except that I'm accused of, uh, of uh, murdering a policeman. I know nothing more than that, and I do request uh, someone to come through uh, to give me uh, a legal assistance. Did you kill the president? No, I've not been charged with that. In fact, nobody has said that to me yet. Uh, the first thing I heard about it was when the newspaper reporters in the hall uh, asked me that question. You have been charged. Nobody said what? Sir? You have been Nobody said what? Okay, man. Okay. So, what did you do in Russia? A policeman hit me. Homicide Captain Will Fritz of Dallas told us just a few moments ago, this case is cinched. This is the man who killed President Kennedy. Here comes Oswald down the hall again. You buy that rifle. The dispatches you people have been given, but I emphatically deny these charges. Oswald has hustled uh, through a doorway. As I say, the original plan by the conspirators was to have Oswald meet someone after the assassination and be killed. Now he's in custody, and this is very dangerous because he might talk. He's now moving into the show up room. Jack Ruby had been involved in mob control enterprises all his life. Ruby is a man the mob knows, and he's a man who can do the job of eliminating because of his access to the police station. Now, it is very clear that Ruby stalked Oswald all weekend, that he spent all the time he could at the police station, and that at one point, 
Uh, he attempted to enter the room where Oswald was being interrogated, and he was stopped by a police officer from doing that. There is an underlying tension here in Dallas. It's not something you can put your hand on, you could see or touch, but it is here. There is talk here in the press room on the pros and cons of possible mob action against Oswald. Someone said there is strong feelings in the state in that direction. Here is the prisoner. Do you have anything to say in your defense? What? Oswald has been shot. Oswald has been shot. Here is young Oswald now. He is being hustled in. He is lying flat. He, to me, he appears dead. There is a gunshot wound in his lower abdomen. Here are some police officials. Who is he? Jack Ruby is the name. Jack Ruby? So we understand he has shot Oswald. One of the most sensational developments in this already fantastic case. Oswald expired at 1.07 p.m. He died at 1.07 p.m. The world will never know the true facts of what occurred, my motives. I'm the only person in the background that knows the truth pertaining to everything relating to my circumstances. The people had, that had so much to gain and, and had such a material motive for putting me in a position I'm in will never let the true facts come of our boards to the, to the world. Now, these people are in very high positions, Jack? Yes. The memorandum and the note in question, and he handed it to me and he said, in effect, uh, Oswald's dead now, there can be no trial. Here, get rid of this. I then proceeded to uh, tear it up. His presence, he said, no, get it out of here. I don't, I don't even want it in this office. Get rid of it. I then took it out and destroyed it. And how did you destroy it? I took it into the uh, washroom and uh, flushed it down the drain. Well, how many agents in the Dallas field office knew about it? I understand about 30. There are indications particularly regarding the FBI's handling of the Mexico trip, that they were not treating Oswald as a suspicious subversive and that they knew he was something else. From the standpoint of J. Edgar Hoover, you have this Marine who defected, who came back and who was now trying to defect again, apparently. It's hard to imagine anybody more suspicious than that, and yet he's not being handled that way. The issue of whether the tapes uh, of these phone calls in Mexico City were sent to Dallas is debated, um, but I think the evidence is pretty overwhelming that they were. It must have been embarrassing for Hoover, and actually he even discussed it with President Johnson the next morning. He actually told Johnson that we'd listen to the tape and it wasn't Oswald's voice. They told us that those tapes had been destroyed and they hadn't been. And that was a bald-faced lie. Today, the CIA will tell you no comment. They should have done that from the beginning. Members of the Warren Commission, Coleman and Slauson, went down there and they listened to at least one of those tapes. So they were still down there in Mexico City uh, in 1964. If we were able to listen today to those tapes, you would realize that it's not Oswald's voice. And so, for someone who's not Oswald to use Oswald's name in a manner that would link him to Castro and the Kremlin six weeks before the president's murder means somebody else was involved in the president's murder in my book. It is very interesting that David Adley Phillips, who was a key CIA agent in Mexico City at that time, uh, and who was later linked to Oswald by a Cuban exile witness, uh, did a treatment for a screenplay. After I retired, I wrote several novels loosely based on what I had learned over the many years in covert operations. One outline revolved around the Kennedy assassination, Central McGuffin, the confessions of the CIA's head of Latin American covert operations to his son. I was one of the two case officers who handled Lee Harvey Oswald. 
After working to establish his Marxist bona fide, we gave him the mission of killing Fidel Castro in Cuba. I helped him when he came to Mexico City to get his visa and when he returned to Dallas to wait for it. I saw him twice there. We rehearsed the plan many times. In Havana, Oswald was to assassinate Castro using a sniper's rifle from an upper floor window overlooking a road that Castro used to drive by in an open jeep. Whether Oswald was a double agent or a psycho, I'm not sure. And I don't know why he assassinated Kennedy. But what I do know is he used exactly the same plan that we had practiced against Castro. Therefore, the CIA did not anticipate the assassination of the president, but we're responsible for it. I share that guilt. To add to setting up the files to link Oswald to Castro and the Kremlin before the fact, uh, we have Phillips's activities just after the fact as well. He actually asks Antonio Vesiana to ask his cousin, Guillermo Ruiz, who was a commercial attache in the Cuban embassy, to lie. Bishop me propone, si, si yo creo que dándole algún dinero, él va a revelar y decir que, que el señor Lía Biogel había estado en México y que habían hablado del complot. Muy poco tiempo después me dijo, olvídate, como si yo nunca te hubiera pedido eso. Pero yo posteriormente estoy investigando pues de acuerdo al gobierno de Castro, alguien que no fui yo trató de convencer a Guillermo Ruiz de que, de que dijera eso. Según el gobierno de Cuba, yo no sé quién puede ser esa otra persona. Así que yo no sé la razón bien por la que él me dijo, olvídate de que hablamos de aquel, de aquel asunto. En otras palabras, to link Oswald to Cuban intelligence just in the hours or days after the assassination and use that story uh, to galvanize the Warren Commission into covering up the case. Now, there are two official verdicts on record. Let's not forget that. The Warren Commission said it was a lone assassin. The House Committee said the president was probably assassinated as a result of a conspiracy involving organized crime figures. I think lots of respectable historians and journalists are scared of it and, and don't want to be tagged as conspiracy nuts. They prefer uh, to take the easy way out and, and just say that, well, uh, if there were a conspiracy, it would have been brought to light by now. Well, actually, it has been brought to light by now, if you were willing to take the trouble to look. Uh, the, the influence of a president uh, is still substantial uh, in his second term. Though I haven't had a second term. I think it is. <laughs> <laughs> Are you looking forward to one, sir? Mr. President. <laughs> Kennedy had refused to get into the Vietnam War and most likely would have refused to have done so had he lived, and it would not have taken place. And that obviously would have had fantastic consequences. The United States, as the world knows, will never start a war. We do not want a war. We do not now expect a war. This generation of Americans has already had enough of war and hate and oppression. Confident and unafraid, we must labor on, not towards a strategy of annihilation, but towards a strategy of peace. For in the final analysis, our most basic common link is that we all inhabit this small planet. We all breathe the same air. We all cherish our children's futures, and we are all mortal. We were on the verge of a tremendous change in American life, having to do with the coming of age of the boom generation. Had Kennedy survived, had he avoided the Vietnam War, Kennedy might have managed to keep the confidence of the younger generation to an extent that Lyndon Johnson and Richard Nixon certainly could not. And the United States might be a measurably different place today.